Oh. All right, do you see the first mistake? Here it is in full screen. Do you see it now? The company is including SBIR dollars in their revenue slide. Don't do this. You wouldn't show money from a friends and family or angel round in your revenue slide, so don't show SBIR, BAA, OTA, CSO, or other R&D funding either. Instead, take the R&D dollars off the revenue slide and move them to the funding slide. So easy. And yet so many companies end up in the trash because of this. Now, some people disagree and that's fine, my opinions are suspect, but later we'll be talking to John Bronson, managing partner of J2 Ventures about the most common issues he sees. All right, mistake number two is here in the projected revenue slide. And this one's a little technical, so let's work through an example together. In red, we have future revenue that's backed by a signed five-year $10 million government contract. So the red's great. Next, in green, we have $10 million a year backed by a $50 million five-year government IDIQ contract. So the red's backed by a contract and the blue's backed by an IDIQ contract. What's the big deal? Well, a lot. The signed contract in red is, well, a contract. The government's agreed to buy 10 million goods and services, and the company's agreed to deliver 10 million goods and services. Pretty straightforward. The actual delivery and payments will happen in the future, but the contract signs so the red revenue is legit. An IDIQ, on the other hand, is technically a contract, but it isn't really a contract. It's more of a framework agreement between the government and a vendor that defines how they'll work together in the future. To help this make sense, here's an example you're probably more familiar with. A pizzeria menu. So when you get a menu, you aren't committed to buy from that pizzeria. And the pizzeria isn't required to sell to you. But having a menu is great for everyone because it lays out the most important information, like what you can buy, how much it'll cost, delivery terms, and how to order. And because the menu makes it easy, you're more likely to buy from them. And an IDIQ is like your menu to the government. It's got your products and services, prices, and other key sales terms. And because you've made it easy, the government's more likely to buy from you, which is why people love them. And these framework agreements have lots of different names, like BPAs, BOAs, IDIQs, GWACs, and schedules. But regardless of what they're called, there are a couple of big differences between them and regular contracts. First, with a contract, the government's committed to buying, while the government has no obligation to actually buy anything through a framework agreement. Second, contracts have a defined value that you're gonna get, while framework agreements have a ceiling, which sets the maximum amount the government can buy through that agreement, not the amount they will buy through that agreement. But a lot of new businesses think that the ceiling is the value, and then make revenue projections based on that ceiling. And I've seen at least two dozen companies make this mistake recently. And it tells me they don't really understand their customer, or that they think I don't understand their customer and that they can get one over on me. Either way, this is a fatal mistake and leads to. So if you have a framework agreement, you can use it to justify some projected revenue, just not the full ceiling amount. Or if you think that the government is going to hit that ceiling, explain why. The third mistake is a go-to-market strategy or customer research section that sounds like, we hired General or Admiral Schmuckatelli and they know everyone. Terrible answer. Generals know other generals and generals usually aren't that helpful. Next, we'll sell through an SBIR phase three. Awful. An SBIR phase three is a contracting method and you still need a customer that has money. Next, we talk to our congressman and they love what we're doing. An elected official told you what you wanted to hear? Well, in that case, embarrassing. Next, my friend of the Navy said they need our product. Great. Ask your friend if they have budget, a contract, and acquisitions authority. Because if they don't, their opinion does not matter. Next, the government funded our R&D, so of course they'll buy the resulting product. Wrong. The parts of the government that fund tech and the parts of the government that buy tech are comically disconnected. Next, the R&D team said that there's a huge market for our product. Did they now? Ask those R&D folks the name and email of one person who could be your customer. Per my last point, R&D folks and buying folks don't talk to each other. Next, we analyzed FPDS data and the government market is worth a billion dollars. Actually, this might be a good answer. I'll want to see your analysis because very few people know how to use FPDS data, but analyzing spend data is a core element of a good go-to-market strategy. And I love the initiative. So I'm rooting for you, but if you want an A plus go-to-market strategy, treat federal go-to-market like commercial go-to-market and do the customer discovery interviews and pair them with top-down, bottom-up, and side-to-side market analysis. 
Mistake number four. If you sell a component of a bigger system, don't tell me that you're gonna to sell to the government. The US government doesn't buy components. They buy complete systems. So if you sell a component, then the business that builds the full system is your customer, not the government. And there's nothing wrong with building components or selling to a prime, but if you do, you're a B2B, not a B2G company. So tell me how you're going to sell to that prime. But enough of me ranting. Let's get J2 Ventures managing partner John Bronson's perspective. So John, thanks for coming on. What are the first three things you look for when a company pitches you? The first three things I would say, first and foremost, is their story coherent? Uh, you know, is it easy to follow? Are they articulate? And it's not just a question of whether or not I can follow and whether or not I want to take the time to follow it. But ultimately, uh, almost all deep tech, all government tech has a B2B sales component. And so if the story isn't coherent to me, it's not going to be coherent to a buyer and that's going to be a problem. So I think that's, that's the first one. Um, the second one related to that is, uh, is it a technology or is it a business? I think frequently we see amazing technologies, transformative technologies where people haven't thought through how they go to market, who's going to buy it, why they're going to buy it. And, uh, and I think that's probably actually the most common failure mode in, in deep tech overall. And three is, does the story of the people doing the, the startup make sense? So is this the person's life work and a logical extension of it? Is it something where they saw a major pain point in a big business and they left to go solve that pain point? Uh, or were they on vacation and they met some stranger and they thought, hey, I don't like my job, so let me start a business. And uh, obviously the first two are great reasons to start a startup. The third one, uh, not so much. Yeah, that makes sense. So the in this video, we've really been talking a lot about the failures that people put into their pitch decks when they're a dual use company. So I was curious, when you're, when you're flipping through a deck, are there any uh, red flags you're looking for? So the second thing I'd say is uh, confusing whether the hard part is the market or hard part is the product. So uh, as you know, my, my favorite example is always uh, inventing a teleporter. And you see a ton of decks where people spend the first half of the deck trying to prove that there's a great market for teleportation. I don't think anybody would disagree that there's an amazing market for teleportation. The question is, how can you actually make it work? And on the flip side, you see all kinds of really interesting technological advances and no real explanation of who's going to buy them and why. So, you know, if, if you can turn, you know, peanut butter into diamond, like that's kind of interesting, but, but what's the, what's the market? Who's going to buy it? Who's going to use it? Um, and so I think when, when you see those types of decks that don't really address the big question that you're trying to answer, it can be very frustrating. I think a, a, another really common failure mode is uh, confusing uh, passing interest from a buyer with uh, with legitimate interest. And so you see a lot of companies that have $50,000 of revenue from a defense prime or $50,000 of revenue from Microsoft. And people get really excited because, well, you know, you know, Microsoft is buying, Lockheed is buying. But for a check that, that small, uh, these these types of big businesses will write you know dozens and dozens of those checks just to take a look at some type of technology, and uh, and so that doesn't really prove that you actually have real traction. It just proves that somebody thought you were interesting enough to take a peek, uh, and which might be fine at this stage of your company. But I think it's important not to confuse those two. Uh, and uh, and actually, I'd say the third one is is not in the deck itself, but I think a lot of times when people are pitching, they make the mistake of jumping straight into the content and not actually taking a few minutes to get to know the person on the other side of the table, understand what's interesting to them, understand what their thesis is. Because you know, ultimately, a lot of investing is finding the right fit between the investor and the portfolio company. And you really want to make sure on both sides of the table that, that there's that connection before you get too far into the pitch. So I, I think that a lot of Strup companies struggle to even get, to, get into the room. Do you have any reflections on what a company can do to help get a pitch in the first place? Absolutely. I think ironically, given that we're all in tech and focused on tech, uh, the actual investing process is remarkably low tech and human to human. And there's no way to to raise money on the internet. You have to meet people um, over Zoom. You have to ultimately probably meet them in person. And warm introductions are worth uh, just worth a ton. And so, um, 
investors are looking for great companies. And so if you go to conferences, you go to events, you talk to your friends, you know, uh, you know just really canvas uh, the space, you'll be able to get in front of some interesting investors. Fantastic. Well, John, thank you so much for joining us and sharing some thoughts with our, with our community. Thanks for having me, Jeff. And now our half mistake, which is using R&D funding and shaky federal revenue projections in your valuation. The typical startup valuation equation is EBITDA times a multiplier. And let's skip the multiplier because it's basically out of your control. But your EBITDA is very much in your control. So if you've inflated yours by slipping R&D funding or notional dollars from a framework agreement in, you're going to end up with an inflated valuation. And I call this a half mistake because valuation typically isn't in the pitch deck. So it's not exactly a pitch mistake, but if your pitch goes well, the VCs are gonna ask for your valuation. And if yours is way out of line, most investors will just bow out rather than spending weeks negotiating with you. So watch out for these mistakes. And if you're ready to pitch, check out this video to find the right dual use venture fund for you.